Hi, in this video we're going to be taking a look at the central limit theorem. Basically the central limit theorem looks at taking a whole bunch of samples from a population and looking at the mean of those samples and considering that to be a, a distribution. So for all the samples of the same sample size, so you do need to be collecting samples that have all the same sample size n and you also want n to be greater than 30. The sampling distribution of the means, x bar, can be approximated by a normal distribution with a mean mu. So this mean mu, remember when you see a Greek symbol, that's from the population. So whatever your original population mean was, that's what this sampling distribution mean will also be. And the standard deviation will be the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So some things that are given, the random variable x has a distribution which may or may not be from a normal distribution, and it has a mean mu and a standard deviation of sigma. Simple random samples, all of size n, are selected from the population. The samples are selected so that all possible samples of the same size n have the same chance of being selected. So that's basically just the definition of having a simple random sample. So our conclusions are that the distribution of the sample will, as the sample size increases, approach a normal distribution. The mean of the sample means is the population mean, and the standard deviation of all sample means is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. You will be doing a lab for this chapter um, that depicts this. So you will generate um, several samples that are from a uniform distribution. And if you take um, all of your sample data um, and you just put it all together, when you make a histogram, it will look just like a uniform distribution. But then when you take the mean from all of your different samples, and you do a histogram of the means from each of the samples, then the um, histogram of the samples should look pretty close to a normal distribution. And so I have you run that twice, um, once with a fewer number of samples and then doing it again with a larger number of samples. And um, it should become closer to a normal distribution when you do it for the larger um, number of samples. So um, so that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool the way that that works out. And so it doesn't matter what the original distribution of the population is. If you take a whole bunch of samples and you find the mean of all of those samples, and then you do a histogram of the means of all of your samples, it should look like a normal distribution. And so we can use um, the normal distribution in order to do calculations for that, which is pretty great. And so this is sort of the basis for the things that we'll be doing going forward um, when we start looking at hypothesis testing and confidence intervals coming up. So just some notation. Um, if all possible simple random samples of size n are selected from a population with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma, the mean of the sample means is denoted by mu sub x bar, so the mean of the sample means is what that's saying, and the standard deviation is sigma sub x sub bar, it's the same thing, it's the standard deviation of the sample means. This is also called the standard error, and we won't really get into too much of what that means. So the mean of all the values, um, x bar, that's mu sub x bar, and it's the same as mu. The standard deviation of all values of x bar, sigma sub x bar, is just sigma divided by the square root of m. And so if we want to do computations now, we can do a z-score conversion. And the formula is basically the same. Instead of just x now, though, you're going to have x bar minus your mean. And then instead of the sigma in the denominator, we have sigma divided by the square root of n in our denominator. So let's take a look at some examples. When designing elevators, an obviously important consideration is the weight capacity. 
An Ohio college student died when trying to escape from a dormitory elevator that was overloaded with 24 passengers. The elevator was rated for a capacity of 16 passengers with a total weight of 2,500 pounds. Weights of adults are changing over time, and the table below shows values for recent parameters. For the following, we assume a worst-case scenario in which all the passengers are males. If an elevator is loaded to capacity of 2,500 pounds with 16 males, the mean weight of the passenger is 156.25. So in order to get this number, they just took this 2,500 pounds and divided by 16. So we want to find the probability that a randomly selected adult male has a weight greater than 165 pounds. So now this is exactly the things that we were doing before. We want to find the probability that x is greater than 156.25 pounds. And so we need to convert this to a standard normal distribution. We're told that these um, values are coming from a normal distribution anyway, so we can use the normal distribution in order to do our calculations. So Z in this case is going to be this 156.25 minus the mean of our distribution. And so the mean weight for males is 182.9. And then we need to divide by our standard deviation, which is 40.8. So this is, oops, and this should be greater than. So we want the probability that z is greater than, and if you take 156.25 minus 182.9, and then divide by 40.8, you should get negative 0.65. So now remember, we're finding this, so here's, a mean of 0, and this is 0 0.65. We want to find this area, but the table only gives us areas on the left, so we need to move that to the other side. We really want the probability that z is less than positive 0 0.65. So let's get our table out, and we want positive 0 0.65. So here's positive 0 0.6, and then 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4, positive 0 0.65. So that's 0 0.7422. So I would say that um, having a 74% you know, chance that a male weight is going to be greater than 156.25 is a pretty good chance that that's going to happen. Find the probability that a sample of 16 randomly selected adult males has a mean weight greater than 156.25 pounds, so that the total weight would exceed the maximum capacity of 2,500 pounds. So here, our sample isn't as big as what we said. We said we wanted n to be greater than 30, but that's if we don't know anything about the distribution that our data is coming from. Since we know that it's coming from a normal distribution originally, you can use an n that's smaller than 30. So this time, when we do our conversion to z, we need to use the new formula. So it's going to be x bar minus mu over sigma sub x bar divided by, well, not sorry, sigma over the square root of n is what we want to use this time. So, and we want to know if this is greater than, so greater than, and um, so we want to know if the mean weight would possibly be bigger than this. So that's still going to be 156.25. And then minus 
the mean that we had before, 182.9, because we're still talking about male. Standard deviation was 40.8, but we need to divide by the square root of m, so we need to divide by the square root of 16. So this is the probability that z is greater than, and so now we need to take 156.25 minus 182.9 and divide by 40.8 divided by 16. So we'll just do these in steps. I'll calculate the numerator first. So if you subtract 182.9 from 156.25, you get negative 26.65 and then take 40.8 and divide by the square root of 16, we get 10.2. So that's the probability that z is greater than negative 2.61. Again, remember, so we want this probability but our table only gives us less than, so we need to move this over. So this is really the same as the probability that z is less than a positive 2.61. So open up our table, and we want 2.61. So this is 2.60, here's 2.61, so 0 0.9955. That is a really good chance that if you take a sample of 16 guys that you're going to be overloaded. In our next example, you need to obtain new desks for an incoming class of 25 kindergarten students who are all five years of age. An important characteristic of the desks is that they must accommodate the sitting heights of those students. The sitting height is the height of the seated student from the bottom of their feet to the top of their knee. The following table lists the parameters for sitting heights for five-year-old children. So we want to know what sitting height will accommodate 95% of the boys. So we want to know probability of x being less than some value is 0 0.95. So first we want to convert this to a z, and we also are going to need to figure out what, um, what z value will give us 95%. So let's get our table out, and we've done this one a couple of times, so now no, a couple of times now, so maybe you even remember this number. So it's this starred number right here inside your table, and if we follow that back, we get a z-score of 1.645. Remember our z-conversion, so that's x minus the mean. We want the mean of the boy's height, so that's 61.8 and then divide by the standard deviation of 2.9. So we need to solve this for x, so we're going to multiply both sides by 2.9, and 1.645 times 2.9 gives us 4.7705 and that equals x minus 61.8. Now add the 61.8 to both sides. And we get x is equal to 66.5705. And these are in centimeters. So a sitting height of 66.5705 centimeters 
will accommodate ninety five percent of five year old boys. In part B, what sitting height is greater than 95% of the means of sitting heights from random samples of 25 boys? So again, 95% means we're going to use uh, 1.645. And then this is for a random sample of 25 boys. So now Z is going to be X bar minus mu over sigma divided by the square root of m. So we have to use our special formula. And so we'll have x bar minus 61.8 divided by 2.9 over, uh, we're taking a sample with 25 boys, so the square root of 25. So first we need to compute this denominator. We have 1.645 equals x bar minus 61.8. And then 2.9 divided by the square root of 25, which is 5, is 0 0.58. So I need to multiply both sides by 0 0.58. And 1.645 times 0 0.548 gives us 0 0.9541. And then we have to add the 61.8 to both sides. And so that gives us x bar is equal to 62.75 four one centimeters. Part C, based on the preceding results, what single value should be the minimum sitting height accommodated by the desks? And why are the sitting heights of girls not included in the calculations? We would use the sitting height from part A as our sitting height for um, boys. So that would be 66.5705. The reason that we would be using this instead of the um, answer from Part B is because the answer from Part B is um, for 25 boys instead of just a single boy. So we're not interested in um, what height will accommodate a sample of 25 boys all sitting in the same desk. We're interested in um, having a single boy sit in the desk. So that would be the answer from part A. And why are the sitting heights of girls not included? And the reason that we don't include those is because if we look up here at the distribution, we can see that the mean height of boys is slightly bigger than the mean height for sitting height for boys is slightly larger than the um, sitting height for girls. So if we make them to accommodate boys, they should um, accommodate the girls as well. So the rare event rule for inferential statistics if under a given assumption the probability of a particular observed event is extremely small, such as less than 0.05, we conclude that the assumption is probably not correct. So in this last example, cans of regular Coke are labeled to indicate that they contain 12 ounces. And the data, this is in a data set from your book. Um, the corresponding sample statistics are n equals 36 
and X bar is 12.19 ounces. Assuming that the Coke cans are filled so that the mean is 12 ounces as labeled and the population standard deviation is 0.11 ounces. Find the probability that a sample of 36 cans will have a mean of 12.19 ounces or greater. These results suggest that Coke cans are filled with an amount greater than 12 ounces. First, we need to convert this to Z. And remember, Z is equal to X bar minus mu over sigma divided by the square root of n. So X bar, the mean, is 12.19 ounces minus the mean of the population is 12 divided by the standard deviation, which is 0 0.11, and that has to get divided by our sample size, square root of our sample size, which is 36. So in the numerator, we have 0 0.19, and in the denominator, 0 0.11 divided by the square root of 6, which is 6, is 0 0.018, and then the 3 repeats. So if you go out to six decimal places, that should be enough. And this gives us 10.36. So we want the probability that z is greater than this, greater than 10.36. Again, greater than 10.36, we need to move it over because our table only gives us less than. So it's going to be the probability that z is less than negative 10.36. And so let's get out our table. And I need the negative side. If you're negative 3.5 or lower, and we are, negative 10.36 is much lower than negative 3.50, you would use a probability of 0.0001. Because we got a probability that's so small, 0 0.0001, um, this does tell us that the Coke cans probably are filled with more than 12 ounces. Um, so there's a couple of things that could happen. Either we got like a really, really rare sample that gave us a mean that was larger than 12.1, 12 ounces, or the mean really is larger than 12 ounces. That's it for this lecture. If you have any questions about anything, let me know, and I hope you're having a wonderful day. Thanks.